Welcome everybody to In Conversation with Lisa Rose. Today's guest is Flora Sage, the author of The One Degree Shift, Discover the Simplicity of Lasting Change. And I've known Flora for I think 12 years now we know each other. Flora, and we work together in her business masterminds. Um, she was my business coach, I think on a couple of occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, we met uh, a long time ago, 12 years ago in Chicago at an intuition development workshop. And so she has all of that energy work happening on her end as well. But for the last 20 years, Flora has been supporting women through personal, spiritual, and business transformations. And that's her hub. <laughs> She's an expert at that. And so today we're gonna to talk about the book. This is the book, people. Go out, run, you know, run and buy it. Go out and run and buy it. Flora, I read this a couple of times, but. So I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I love about Flora. This is just, you know, personally, I, she is the queen of transformation. Mm -hmm. And I am amazed and inspired by Flora, how you fearlessly, and I mean fearlessly, change your life and business when you want something different. And on the outside, you know, on the outside looking in, you make it look so easy. I know it's not all that easy, but you make it look so easy. Like in the last year, like I've been watching you. And in the last year, you sold your home in Wisconsin and moved to Arizona right? Leaving the land of ice and snow for, you know, dry heat and sun. <laughs> you changed your business to focus on helping create this change using the one degree shift method that you also created. Uh, we just talked briefly about letting go or pausing some of the memberships that you had because you are feeling called to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. And then you published a book and peeps, she did all this during the pandemic. <laughs> All right, so congratulations, really congratulations. I mean, I just, I'm inspired and I'm amazed by you. So here's my first question, Flora. How do you decide, like how do you decide when the time is right to make a big change? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we're all tapped into our intuition here. And it's really when my intuition, I, when I can't ignore my intuition, <laughs> when my peeps are like, Hello, knock, knock, knock. Hello, <laughs> this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel in alignment. And it really is when I start to feel that resistance constantly, like, oh, I have to do a live stream today with, you know, whatever, or, oh, I have to go and do that. Or, oh, and when I'm just not having fun anymore and when it feels like a chore and when it feels like something, I just have to check off my list. And then I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Is that really what we want to do with our life? Do we really just want to just check stuff off the list and just try to get to the end? Because nobody gets out alive. You know, we're all in this and we really like all of us have the same end destination is try to do what we can with the time that we have. We don't know how much time we have, but that's one of the things that I actually learned early on is my mom passed away when I was 12 and my dad passed away eight years ago. It's um, and in watching my dad die slowly from cancer versus my mom die suddenly in a car accident, that's a huge wake up call where all of a sudden you're like, what am I doing with my life? And am I enjoy? Am I having fun? It, does this feel good? Does this feel in flow? And your intuition, as you teach, it's your internal GPS. It's like, it guides you because, okay, this feels good. Mm, this doesn't feel so good. This feels good. Mm, this doesn't feel so good. So I really let my intuition be my guide. And like, does this still feel in flow? Does this feel in alignment? Does this feel true to who I am? And I know that that's what you teach truly living. It's like, are you really truly living? Mm -hmm. And when I realize that things just feel off and they don't, feel in alignment. I'm not truly living. I'm just, I'm just existing. I'm checking the boxes, waking up, checking the boxes, going to bed. And I don't, I don't like that cycle because I've seen so many people in that cycle and they're miserable and yeah. we're not meant to be miserable. We're meant to have fun and be in joy and live. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. All about your own personal truth. And yeah. Uh, you represent that so well. You know, one a couple of things I love about this book is the, as I said before, the book itself it's a, a reflection of your mission and your expertise. It's small people, but this is mighty like dynamite. Yes, <laughs> right. It's effective in its simplicity, and I just thought that you know, that the book matches the concept. Uh, you will definitely 
learn something and it will change your life in some way. I promise you this. So it looks like it's a quick read, but it's filled with prompts and exercises that really cause you to slow down. Yes. You know, and if I first got this, I thought, oh yeah, I'll read this in a couple of hours. Right? Wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and then like, I had to really think about my life, you know, and how to create change with continuous, you know, small steps forward, which is the gist of, you know, the one degree shift method is not doing the big overwhelming 180, you know, uh, which is taught by so many, oh, you wanna make a change, you can change everything. And then you change nothing because it's, it's too much. So I wanna read for everybody that's watching. I wanna read this paragraph. I hit rock bottom and decided that I was done living a directionless life. I found a scrap of a vision and began resetting my habits. I confronted my bullshit, honed that vision, and began shifting my life toward all that was possible. I changed everything. I did it step by step, day by day, and one degree at a time. And this is something that you are describing about yourself when you were 18 years old. Yep. 18 years old. So with this book, Laura, do you feel like you've come full circle? I actually feel like I'm just getting started. <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay, so just getting because started it's like life it's not a circle it's this it's this spiral it's this it's this yeah. dance it's this ebb and this flow and it's like if i'm going full circle i'm doing something wrong because that means i'm going right back to where i started and i <laughs> that has happened in my life that has happened and then i'm like oh shit i'm here again really okay so yeah that was the gist of my question because when i look at it i i was feeling the vibration i was feeling when you made this shift was like oh my gosh she was born to do this work this is the work that she was born to do, you know? So, okay. So uh, I want to talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the bullshit. Yes. <laughs> let's talk about the bullshit. Let me go to page 31. Yes. Well, it all starts with being honest with yourself and calling out the bullshit. Ask yourself, what is truly overwhelming right now can you just talk a little bit about what's the best way to identify your own bullshit because that's in your book that's where you say you got to start not outside but inside it's when you keep trying to convince yourself of oh i should be doing this or i need to be doing that and well it's not that bad and we just try to keep convincing ourselves of something that we know deep down is bullshit it's literally it's, it's a story. It's this facade of a, this shell of something that we think we need to be or do or have. And deep down, it just feels wrong. It doesn't feel good. It's not in alignment. And that's when you're just like, wait a minute, who am I kidding? And how you can tell is it's exhausting. <laughs> it is exhausting. Because when you're living in alignment with yourself, who you truly are, it's easy. And I'm not saying that it's not going to have a lot of steps involved, but it's easy. It feels, it feels easy because you're not convincing yourself to stay. You're not convincing yourself to do something. Sometimes we might lack motivation and then you're like, all right, let me put my big girl panties on and just do this. But it just feels, it just feels in alignment. And when you have to convince yourself day in and day out, it's not that bad. I can do this and, oh, you know, but it's, it's, it's that the feeling of that you're not really being true to who you are. It feels fake. It feels like a facade. It feels like you're trying to fit into a box that, you know, you weren't meant for, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And sometimes we think we are, and we're like, hell yeah, let's do this. So you jump in that box and you're like, woo, and you're good for like six months. And then you're like, okay, this is not me. Who am I trying to kid? You know what I mean? <laughs> I do. I mean, sometimes I call that leaving supposed to, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. Yes. You know, and when you buy into I'm supposed to, that's really your bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, in the book, you talk about what types of bullshit, you know, environmental uh, clutter, body, body clutter. That was great. That, yeah. that This was really great about scanning so that you could correlate it with how you feel and be able to identify the bullshit mm -hmm. here by based on what's happening in the physical realm. That was brilliant. The one I want to talk about, because you just, I just saw that you did this, was the unplugging, where you recently unplugged for a digital detox. 
So how, how were you different afterwards? What happened? What were the changes? What was the benefit? I just did a 14 day digital detox, 14 days. My intention was to start with three days of a vow of silence. My ego was just not shutting up. So I did it for five days. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> that, that was huge. And during that 14, I know it was crazy. I was like, what? Because I'm a talker. Okay. I love communicating yeah. with people. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that I went for five days without talking, it was painful at first. Oh my, I cried. It was painful, but I allowed myself to recognize why it was painful. What was painful and noticed in my body where I was feeling it. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like this is so it's when you can't talk, when you can't communicate, you have no choice, but to go within and feel what your body is doing, the signals that it's communicating and telling you and, and you get in tune with your intuition, like a gazillion times more like there, it, like, it's crazy. It's crazy how much more in tune with yourself you get, you start to hear those little God whispers. I like to call them. Yeah. And that, that those, those little nudges of, yeah, no, you don't need to do that. Or, Oh, do more of this, you know, play more and do this and do that. And so during my 14 days, I had, Oh my, so many ups and downs and so many epiphanies and so many aha moments. And I was actually scared and sad for it to end. Cause I'm like, Oh, I want to save this. I want to like, because that container of, you know, waking up and meditating and doing yoga and being super mindful of every single thing that you're doing. Well, we should be mindful anyway. Right. Like throughout the day, but we get so caught up in our to-do list and I, okay, I got to wake up and I got to send emails and I got to do this and do that. And blah, blah, blah. But to be super intentional and mindful about everything and not talk is huge. So how I, how this changed me, I feel more like me. I almost like want to start crying because I'm going to totally start crying. Oh. <laughs> um, I feel like I found myself again and I didn't realize I was lost in the first place. And exactly. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, and, and during that said, Hannah, during that 14 days, I realized that doing my memberships didn't feel in alignment anymore. And, and I asked myself and I cried when I made that choice. I was like, Oh, but I've always done my, I've always done my memberships. And to not do that felt like I was, I was like taking a part of me away. And I'm like, am I going to feel as excited for work and for, you know, being of service as I do now, like, Oh, you know, and I was like, Oh shit. Like this is, so I was kind of panicky, but then I'm like, why am I doing my membership? So because I've always done them and I'm just like, okay. So I had to really just lean into that and be like, okay. So after that 14 days, I realized that you can keep that energy of that 14 day practice throughout the rest of your life, if you're mindful enough. And that was the thing, like I said, I, I rediscovered myself and found myself and I didn't even know that I was lost. And through that, I've been so much more intentional about following my intuition, which I think I thought it was pretty good before, but I was like, oh, dang, <laughs> you know, because it's those little tiny subtleties, those little nudges here and those little nudges there that literally make a world of difference. And that's the whole premise of the one degree shift is you don't have to go big or go home. You don't have to do a 45 degree shift or a 90 degree or a 180 degree shift sometimes you can just do one tiny shift. And that one tiny shift sometimes is just a mindset shift. Sometimes it's, I'm not even going to think about that today. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this thing that's coming in two weeks. I'm not going to, I'm not going to even go there. So I'm going to pivot and I'm going to just put a song on and I'm going to dance until I forget about this thing that's going to happen. And so allowing myself to recognize that those little nudges are not just for the big stuff. It, I mean, it's, it's for everything. And yeah, like I said, I, I found myself and I didn't even know that I was lost. <laughs> I do understand that several years ago, about seven years ago, I think was the first time I did it. I took a, a solo retreat and I mean, solo baby. I went to Sardinia in the middle of the Mediterranean. I don't speak the language. I checked into a place 
And I turned, I decided I was going to turn my phone. I wasn't going to check in with anyone or anything. Day one was easy. Day yeah. two, I was tempted. I was I pick up the phone. I put it down. I pick up the phone. I put it down. Then I started thinking, people are worried about me. I, I, I'm being irresponsible by not, you know, checking in. And right, <laughs> so there's my bullshit. And then I thought, no, 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 I'm going to put it away. And I didn't pick it up for, I think it was day five before I sent a message, you know, to people that would want to know I was okay. <laughs> And that was it. And then I said, that's it. I'm not going to be on this phone. And I, I had, I, I understand it. You, you're just with you. And then you find out really quickly if you like you, if you like being with you. I mean, if you, if you are really upset by being yourself, you probably don't like yourself very much. Right. Yeah. And so you discover what, what, what's really going on. And then you always come back, you know, change and yeah, when you quiet everything down, you can easily hear your heart. You can hear your intuition. You can hear it your guides, you can commune with the great all, you know, with the yep. universe, source, God, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. I started doing that pretty regularly. Now I couldn't do it during the pandemic. Never have I ever been holed up in one place. Oh no. For so long. Did you know I lived in three places for 10 years? Yeah. And you had that experience uh, in Hawaii, right? Yes. Yeah. Because I, you know, I lived there for 20 years and um, you know, it's a whole nother topic, but Matt and Pele. Yes. <laughs> takes what you no longer need and gives you what you do. And she does that in a variety of ways. <laughs> yes. And that was one of the things when I was there, I had this huge download and this huge aha moment and this cleansing and washing over me under a waterfall downloaded to me was travel light, travel light. But yeah, it's crazy when you unplug all the all that mind chatter from social media, from news outlets, from everybody, it just st starts to melt away. And you do, you really do start to all of a sudden recognize the company that you're in. And you're like, hmm, do I like my own company? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> and you do, you really do get reacquainted with yourself. And it is interesting that that mind chatter that happens like, oh, I need to do this. I need to check in with that. I have to do this. And you're like, no. I'm good. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> You're probably also getting a clearer vision of what it is that you want, yeah. right? So this brings me to uh, page 101 in your book, The Dream Life Chapter. Mm -hmm. And I love this because it starts with the, uh, as you say, it starts with a clear vision. If you're unclear, right? Where, where are you ever going to take the next step? And you describe that in a real humorous way, you know, <laughs> in this book. Here's the thing I wanted to ask you, because I know, I know you work with a lot of people. You've had this conversation with probably even in your consults before you even work with somebody. Yep. Why are so many people stumped when you ask, what is your dream life? Oh my gosh, where should I start? Movies, social media, TV, magazines, they all claim you have to have X, Y, Z to be happy. If you want to look this good, you have to have this. If you want to have a fabulous marriage, you have to have that. If you want to look successful, you have to drive this kind of car. And so we get confused because we think, oh, okay. So if I want to be happy, if I want to feel content and fulfilled, I have to have the big house, the cars, the boats, the animals, the kids, the whatever. You and and so people are like, oh shit! So I better get all these things, and then they're like, okay, I have all these things. Why am I not happy? Sometimes people are fortunate enough to live and grow up in a household where their caregivers say, "What do you want? Mm -hmm. What what feels good for you? Do you want kids or not?" Mm -hmm. And that's a big taboo thing, like having okay. like a woman not having children. Oh my gosh, she must be so selfish. It's like, no, like some people want kids, some people don't. Like it shouldn't be mandatory. And like I grew up where you you graduate college and well, first of all, you go to college, you graduate, you get married, you have kids, you have the house, you have the job that you have for the rest of your life, you retire, you're good. And I'm like, oh God, that is not me. <laughs> I mean, I've got two kids. I've had the house, the cars, all the things. And I realized that's not going to make you happy. Ask yourself, do I really want this? And who told me that I have to have this? Do I want the big house? I don't want the big house because I don't want to clean it. I want a smaller, small house with lots of windows and I'm good. I'm totally good with that because I'm kind of a minimalist, but like until we start questioning the status quo, 
we don't know. We just kind of assume this is what people have and this is what's going to make me happy. Yeah, I think that I also would add to that is money. And, yes. uh, you know, I've, I've lived a life with no money mm-hmm. and I've lived a life where I did pretty well and I've, I've got a little extra money to spend. Mm-hmm. And it's like the money uh, doesn't make you happy. Mm-hmm. And I have so many people chasing money instead mm-hmm. of chasing their mission or how they want to contribute or who, you know, what it is they really want to experience as a soul. Mm-hmm. And they're chasing the money. You know, yeah, you need to pay your bills, right? So yep. we're not going to say you should not make any money here. But <laughs> when the focus is on, I get money, then I'm happy. And they hold off the happiness until they get the money. And I would say money makes your life easier, but it does not make you happy. That's right. your responsibility. Yep. You know, and if you've ever watched the statistics on people who've won the lotto <laughs> after they go insane and they, they buy the drugs and the whores and the cars and the houses and the vacations and they buy all their friends the same thing, then they're broke yep. <laughs> and they're still <laughs> unhappy. Right. Yep. You know, so uh, money, you know, we'll talk about that in, in a minute, but, you know, money is energy. But yeah, mm-hmm. that's something I would add about add to that one about what, what their stunts. Oh, if I, if I had more money. You know, I would be yep. really happy. That would make me happy. And I'd be like, oh, no, honey, it won't. So uh, here's my question for you. What are you dreaming about for yourself next? Let's say like in the next few years. What's your, Ooh, what's your dream? Okay. So I am an empty nester. So that's the phase of life that I'm in, which I actually don't talk about that in my book. Um, so I, 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 as an empty nester, my dream is to get rid of the house and get an RV and just RV around the country and just see the country. I'm like so excited. Well, then also I can come to people, I can do retreats, sure. I can work one-on-one with people because I do all kinds of things, as you know. One of the things that I also do is I help people declutter their homes, which also help people declutter mentally, emotionally, physically, all that thing. And so I can then kind of go to people and work with people one-on-one and they, I, I, I go to them so they don't have to come to me. And, um, I'm so excited about it. Oh That's a great idea. <laughs> so uh, how important it, you know, I want to talk about focusing on one thing, because when I got to this page mm-hmm. about focusing on one thing, and you talk about in here that several years ago, you decided to try something different instead mm-hmm. of balancing 10 different aspects uh, of my business. I focused on one, my mm-hmm. mastermind mafia program. And this program was designed to help women build, grow, and talk about it. Uh, and you already had clients for a while, but this time you wanted to be available uh, to the masses. Mm-hmm. And I read that and I thought to myself, I, this, this isn't part of the book where I felt like you were speaking directly to me because you, we know each other very well. And you know that when I first met you, we were both just doing everything. Yes. <laughs> this, 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 really multi-creative people. We wanted to express all these things. We get bored really easy. Uh, oh, I got a new offer. Uh, I think I want to do this now. Or maybe I'll do this. And that's kind of how I was running my show, you know, as well. And exhausted. It yeah. was exhausting trying to do that. And, and uh, when I read this, I tried to do something different. And mm-hmm. I thought, wow, that's, that's fearless. And you, you really pivoted and shifted and focused in on the Mastermind Mafia. And it became a great success. I was in that program for a while when we were doing the coaching together. It was great. Uh-huh. You know, how important is it to, to chase how you want to feel versus achieving the goal? Ooh, that's good. Ooh, that's good. Okay. So I have a whole chapter called chasing happiness. Mm-hmm. And that essentially is when you're not clear about what your goal is. And for me, I have, I don't have money goals. I have service goals. Like I want to be of service to a hundred thousand people this month or 10,000 people this month or a million people this year. So for me, it's about service before I got that clarity. I was chasing happiness in my business. I thought, Oh, so I'll, I'll launch this program and that program and this one and this one and this one thinking if I, if I launch all of these things, I'll have X number of dollars per month. So, you know, that elusive $10,000 a month for coaches, whatever. And, but the thing is, is when I got there and when I expanded that, I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel happy. Mm -hmm. And so when I was chasing that, 
it was more ego-based. It, it was what I thought I needed to do instead of what I felt like I needed to do. Chasing that feeling is that, that thing that we think we need versus the goal of what, what feels in alignment? Like what really is my, if, if everything was just a clean slate, what feels in alignment? What feels like, what would like, if, if this was my last year on the planet, what would I regret not doing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that when I ask myself that question, it's like, I don't want to chase the money. I want to chase the impact, the service. And so I'm, so when I make a goal, it's how can I make the biggest impact with the least amount of effort? Mm -hmm. And I'm not being lazy. It's like, when you are living true to who you are, it's almost effortless because you're, you're just being you. Mm -hmm. And when you're just you, you inspire so many people. Mm -hmm. And especially when someone says, wow, like, what are you doing? You're, you look so great and you look so happy. And I love that you travel all the time and all these other things. And you kind of act as that catalyst possibly for that person's change because they see that you're not chasing that some elusive whatever. You're, you are being of service to yourself by saying, this is what feels good for me. So this is what I'm doing. And so hopefully that will help someone else get clear about, well, what do I want? Like, hmm. So I think that that's, that's really important is to just get really clear about what feels in alignment. And if, is it ego-based? Is it what you think you need to do instead of what feels really good to do? It also uh, speaks to how your intuition sometimes shows up by communicating with you and feeling. You know, yes. yeah, there's the emotional feelings and there's, you know, your intuition can actually communicate with you through feelings as well. So yep. uh, going after that feeling that when it's congruent and you're in alignment, there is a, a certain vibration and a certain feelings. You can identify them, even uh, being a little scared, but excited. Yes. You know, some people will yes. say, oh, I'm scared. I'm excited, but I'm scared. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to go. And then there's others, like, I'm scared and I'm excited. So I know that that means I'm going to go. Uh -huh. I'm getting, I'm getting <laughs> in the front, you know, the, it's like you're getting in the front car of the roller coaster. <laughs> and that's one of the things too, is I've shared this. I think we may have, I may have learned this the same time you did possibly in that intuition training is fear and excitement physiologically feel the same energetically. They're totally different. Fear yeah. is tight and restrictive. Yeah. Excitement is expansive. And, yeah. and how you can tell is, can you take a deep breath? Mm -hmm. Because if you can't, okay, you're in fear. Yeah. But if you can take a deep breath, that's excitement. Yeah, yeah. One, one, one might be the, the pause until you get over the fear, or maybe there's something else that uh, you need to do before it becomes relaxing, right? Yes. So it could also be your intuition speaking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not really afraid. Your intuition is saying, we had to have a little caution here. You need to be a little concerned, yeah. you know, so we'll, we'll give you that signal uh, yeah. and go that way. Now, let me ask you this. How do you resist the temptation to start a new project instead of focusing on the one you decided you were going to put all your energy in. You know, like when you decided, you know, I'm, I'm done with the memberships for a while. I'm working, focusing on this. And three days later, you're like, oh yeah, I got this other idea. You know, how, how, do you, how do you resist? Because that happens to me all the time. And I'm, I'm in this process now too. And I'm thinking, I wonder how she does it. How does she resist the temptation? When I make a choice, like when I pivot and say, I'm just going to focus on one thing, it literally is an amalgamation of these little tiny nudges from spirit saying, this feels off. And it starts just on a whim. Like all of a sudden one day I show up and something feels off. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. I'll note that. And then I just go about my day. And then something else feels off. And I'm like, huh, okay. So that, that collectively, when I'm like, when I make that decision of I'm only going to focus on one thing, it's kind of that collection of those little nudges where all of a sudden I'm like, okay, so now there's too many of these nudges to stop this, to ignore. Like I have to just go, okay, I'm done. But when I get that urge to create a new program or to write another book. I'm not there yet because <laughs> I'm doing updates to this one. But 
what I, what I do is I stop and say, can I do this within the container that I've set for myself? So right now my focus is my podcast and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Well, and also my TikToks. My container is the one degree shift. So when I get that urge to do something else, like to produce another class or program, or I'm like, okay, hang on. Can I play in this field inside the container that I've created for myself? Is this another iteration of the one degree shift? Is this another, you know, like iteration of the mastermind mafia, whatever it is. And so even though publicly I don't have my business membership anymore, I still work with people privately building their businesses. So if somebody signs up to do a business coaching with me, they automatically get access to the Mastermind Mafia. Same thing for private coaching, they automatically get access to the One Degree Shift Tribe. So I ask myself, can I play in the container that I've created for myself? If the answer is no, but it's not going away, then I ask spirit for guidance on how to best um, play with that energy and create something that will be of service to the people. And it could be a series of podcasts, it could be a series of videos, or it could be a new program, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but I really just sit with it and say, how can I do this in the container that I've set for myself? So working within your container, which is basically what your priority is, so mm -hmm. when you're really and going back to the dream life, which if you're really clear on your vision, your priorities become clear, your actions become clear, you end up yes. getting more of what you want. It's all connected. And I love how you present it in this book as, it, it, I mean, in this book, people, <laughs> she gives you the one degree shift method. It's here. It's not like she's holding back and you're going to get it somewhere else. Oh, it's all here. Yep. You have to just do, but you have to do the work. Yes. So I'm going to go to uh, another topic on the, in the book called uh, "Letting Go of Excuses," page one twelve. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is this is I want to read. You're, you're quoting somebody in here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't let go of the if you don't let go of the excuses you create, you will be stuck where you are indefinitely. You might be thinking now, and here you're quoting. No, Flora, I really wanted this thing in my life. I believe that I could get it, but then this whole shit storm happened, and now it's just not realistic. And uh, then you say, when we begin to change our thoughts, we begin to notice the qualifiers or the disclaimers running through our heads. And these are the reasons why or why not we can or cannot have something. I mean, who doesn't love Ford's quote, right? You, you, <laughs> yes. You know, <laughs> if you think you get it, you will. And if you think you won't, you, you, you'll, you know, you're right. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's one of the best ones. I love that when I came across that in the book. It's an oldie but a goodie. Yep. So I was sure that four years ago, I called Flora. We were working together at that time. Four years ago, I called Flora after I had, I, I was hit by a shit hurricane and uh, not of my own making, but you know, I, I was, it was circumstantial for me. And I was just devastated because I had planned this whole, you know, dream life. I was so close to getting it. And then this thing happened, I had to basically forget the dream and, and was about to realize that I was going to be, I was becoming a sudden caregiver in a real big way. And I remember I called you and I was like, you know, I did everything right. I didn't do anything wrong here. You know, I lined it all up. I, you know, got everything together. It, it, I, everything was coming so easy. And then this shit hurricane happens to me. I didn't even do anything to cause it. And now I'm fucked. You know what I mean? Like my, there goes my dream. Uh, now what? And you said to me, wait a minute wait a minute and think about this differently. And you said, it's not over. You just don't have it yet. Yep. Do you remember that? It changed yep. everything, right? It changed everything. So what I want to know is, is this quote about me? <laughs> were, you, were you quoting me? Did I actually get in the book? So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you, and I love this, when you encounter uh, this type of resistance, in my case, like the resistance was circumstantial. Mm -hmm. You must shift your plan, not the goal. Yes. And I yes. think that sharing that is when, when you encounter this type of resistance and resistance can be lots of different things. You must shift your plan, not mm -hmm. your goal. And in the example that we were talking about, I had a plan that I absolutely did not want to let go of. I had yeah. carefully planned every, you know, planned it. It was all going. And then I had to Put it on hold. So uh, give an example, Flora, of how you shifted your plan, but not your goal. Being in the Marine Corps, 
one of our unofficial mottos is adapt and overcome. Okay, so if something is not going according to plan, let's assess the situation and see what we know and what we don't know. And usually there's a lot that you don't know, but you don't know that you don't know it. So yay. <laughs> so you assess the situation, you assess what you have on hand and say, okay, if this still is my end goal and this obstacle is in the way, well, what's the opportunity in this obstacle? And when you look at the opportunity within the obstacle itself, you totally shift how you perceive the situation. Mastermind Mafia. So I started doing business coaching with people. And so I was doing private coaching with, with those clients for a long time. And then after, I think about five or six or seven years, I had a lot of people saying, I can't afford your private coaching prices. Can you coach me on like a group level, but teach me how to do what you do or whatever. And I'm just like, hmm, okay. That's where the mastermind mafia was born was I'm like, okay, so here's an obstacle. How can I pivot so that I can be of service to more people? Cause again, I've, I've always been a service based goal person. Like I, my goal has always been, how can I be of service? Mm -hmm. And so I recorded all of the modules, all the stuff that I, I, I work with my one-on-one -on -one clients about, I just basically put it in a program launched it, great success. And then after several years, I'm like, okay, that feels complete, which that felt weird to be able to all of a sudden go, okay, I'm done. And I'm like, wait, what? Hang on. So that was an obstacle. All of a sudden, I'm just like, um, my goal is still to be of service. My goal is to help empower people. And how can I still have this goal if I'm not going to do it at a group level, well, let's do it privately. Okay, perfect. Cause that's what it started at, at the, you know? So I'm like, okay, perfect. Yeah. So I closed that membership down for public for that, that group feeling and just changed it back to private. And I'm like, yeah. oh, there you go. So my goal is still the same to help people yeah. build, grow and scale their businesses, right. but I'm still, I'm doing it in a different way. And so um, yeah, I mean, looking at the opportunity within that obstacle is huge because that gives you, like I said, that opportunity to pivot the way that you're looking at something so that you can see maybe what you might have missed. I love it. That's a good answer. <laughs> I remember one time uh, I, I was bummed out about a know about something and a Dr. Sugar, my fabulous man in my life, uh, he said to me, um, oh, you got to know. So I guarantee you there's at least three other ways to get the yes. He says, you're still staring at the no. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, there's three other ways to get there? Now I'm interested, hey. you know? And then, you know, so yeah. And, that's, and I thought yours was reflective of that same, you know, ideology. Uh, well, speaking of the yeses and the noes, yeah. um, Jack Canfield talks about this in his book, The Success Principles. And he talks about when someone says no, and I think I actually put this in my book because it was so profound. I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, this is so good. When someone says no to you, you are literally in the exact same position you were before you asked. Right. The exact same, but we, we tend to put so much uh, weight on that no, that yeah, you, you start staring at that no and you're like, oh my gosh. And okay, there's all these other different ways that you can go about getting what you want. So let's just- Exactly. <laughs> and, and what happens is when you screw, you're basically screwing yourself over there psychologically because what you're doing is adding the rejection when it didn't exist before. Yes. You know, you're going to laugh at this, but we, right before I, I was thinking, what color do I want to wear, right? So that I uh -huh. don't, I don't uh, conflict with wh whoever I'm talking with. And I closed my eyes and I said, what is Flora wearing? And I saw the base is blue. Yep. Yay. So I put blue on. So we, I still got it, right? We still got it. We're able, able to connect. 